The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series, Key Battles in the Revolutionary War. In the last episode, we did a sidetrack where we saw the war shift south, and we also looked at the treason of Benedict Arnold and discussed whether it was treason or maybe we've been a little bit too hard on him and perhaps we should rehabilitate Benedict Arnold. I'm not going to rehash that all over again. In this episode, we're going to look at Key Battles 8 and 9, Kings Mountain and Cowpens. But these are pretty simple battles, probably the simplest we are going to look at in the series. We're going to do one more brief biographical excursus before we get into those battles. And this is someone that really is worth taking a closer look at, and that is Lord Cornwallis. James, tell us about our friend or enemy, our frenemy, Cornwallis. Yes, Cornwallis, very important figure in the late part of the American Revolution, He was born in 1738 and thus was six years younger than Washington. Uh, He's actually a character in The Patriot. We keep talking about The Patriot, uh, but it's there, so why not? Uh, The actor that played him was too old, really. He was much older than the actual Cornwallis. Cornwallis in 1778, 79, would have been in his very early 40s. So, you know, a man in the prime of his life, not an old man by any stretch of the imagination. He was too young. Well, actually, no, I'm sorry. He was not too young. He had joined the British Army in 1757, so he did not completely miss out on the Seven Years' War. He did fight with distinction on the continent. He was elected to the House of Commons in 1760 at the age of 22. And upon his father's death, two years later, he was elevated to the House of Lords. He became the Earl of Cornwallis. And that's why he has the title Lord. He was promoted to Major General in 1775 and then Lieutenant General the next year. So the equivalent of what we would call today a three-star general, the the second highest rank after full general. He served with Howe and Clinton until Clinton put him in charge of the Southern British forces in 1780. So not too much, just a little bit of his career prior to uh, his service in the American South. But Scott, you had some information that about Cornwallis after the war. Yeah, I think we'll save this uh, with the final uh, Where Are They Now episode. But I will just say that, as you said, he's a young man. By no means is his career over after the Revolutionary War. He remains a servant of the British Empire. So this is just one theater of battle, if you prefer, of the different fights that are happening in the British Empire. And he goes elsewhere. So He has an interesting fate, and his fate takes him far from England, and I won't say where, but his grave today is not in England. It's in a very interesting location, so I'll save that for later. Stay tuned, listeners. (laughs) Yes, he has a very interesting life, as do many of these British figures, because the loss of the colonies was not the be-all, end-all. And in fact, after the Revolutionary War, there's what some historians call, I think it's the Second British Empire, where it continues to grow in might and power. The colonization of Africa really goes in full force in the 19th century. And for a lot of people, for a lot of figures, they don't want to lose the colonies by any means, but they just get up and dust themselves off and continue business as usual of building a huge empire. But that is a gigantic scope. Let's exchange our telescope for our microscope and look at King's Mountain. So what's going to happen at King's Mountain? All right. King's Mountain. Cornwallis sent Major Patrick Ferguson, who had the nickname the Bulldog. He was a really tough soldier, a hard, hard commander, uh, no nonsense. This is the man Scott mentioned earlier who had a chance to shoot George Washington, but turned it down because it didn't seem gentlemanly. Pretty big mischance. Yes. Thank you, Major Ferguson. We appreciate that. (laughs) Appreciate your restraint there. But he's not going to use a lot of restraint when he goes into western North Carolina. He's sent over there to recruit Loyalist soldiers and to protect Cornwallis' flank. Because at the time, Cornwallis and the main body of his army, they were near Charlotte, North Carolina. Ferguson, in in addition to trying to recruit Loyalists, he engaged in a campaign of plunder. 
again, there's the, the idea that especially in the South, the British were especially harsh, especially cruel. And it's kind of ironic to me, Scott, that here he is plundering the countryside while at the same time trying to recruit people. Hey, come join us. We're great. Oh, by the way, give me your, uh, give me your cows and give me your, your grain and all that. Hopefully it's not the same people, or maybe it is the same people. Yeah, I imagine not, but he probably limited his plundering to, I'm sure he limited to the known patriots, people who had no chance of joining the loyalist forces. Ferguson issued a proclamation to local patriots that read as follows. If you do not desist in your opposition to the British, I shall march this army over the mountains, hang your leaders, and lay waste to your country with fire and sword. <laughs> so, All right. Okay. Yeah, he, throwing down the gauntlet. I am going to destroy you. Well, they say in marketing, people should agree with you or disagree with you, but they should never misunderstand you. So there, he is not misunderstood. There's no doubt about what his plans are. This proclamation, I should say, was aimed primarily at what were called at the time over-mountain men. These are settlers who lived beyond the Appalachians, by the way, in violation of British law. <laughs> These are mountain people, and they detested the British, especially detested them. Several small militia units, some from over the mountains, other from upstate North and South Carolina, marched toward Ferguson's force to try to uh, stop this guy from carrying out these evil plans. And by October 1780, Ferguson's force consisted of 120 British regulars and about 1,000 loyalist militiamen, although 200 were away on a foraging campaign. So he's got roughly 900-ish people under his command, but again, only 120 British regulars, so not too many professionals. Ferguson, hearing of the Patriots' approach, sent a dispatch to Cornwallis asking for reinforcements. But Cornwallis was ill, and he just did not reply. He wasn't able to get back to him. Ferguson deployed his force on a hill at Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which is near the border with South Carolina. It was a flat-topped hill covered with pine trees. Seemed like a pretty good decision, seemed like a good defensive position. If anybody tried to attack him, they would have to go up the hill, and they should be easily picked off, except for the pine trees are going to hide them. <laughs> but other than that, and this is what Patrick Ferguson, the British major in, in command here, this is what he told his soldiers. He said, "If you, unless you wish to be eat up by an inundation of barbarians, I say, if you wish to be pinioned, robbed, and murdered, and see your wives and daughters in four days abused by the dregs of mankind. In short, if you wish or deserve to live and better the name of men, grasp your arms in a moment and run to camp. The backwater men have crossed the mountains. If you choose to be pissed upon forever, and yes, he did say that, <laughs> and ever set ever by a set of mongrels, say so at once and let your women turn their backs upon you and look out for real men to protect them. Okay. He knows how to challenge their manhood to fight. Okay. Mm -hmm. Totally over the top rhetoric. <laughs> Just great. And this is another tactic we see in a lot of wars where one side tells their forces the other side they're barbarians they're going to attack you they're going to skin you alive they're going to do all this stuff rape your women kill your children make them slaves all that they demonize the enemy to try to fire up their forces so we'll see if it works yeah we'll see if this battle is worthy of his uh, fighting words yes we will on october 7th the patriots with about 900 men surrounded ferguson's army one of the Patriot commanders shouted, here they are, my brave boys, shout like hell and fight like devils. Many of the men shouted, Buford, who was the American commander at Waxhaws. Waxhaws, again, was the place where Amer about 300 Americans surrendered and Tarleton ordered that they be executed. Prior to the battle, the Patriots put pieces of white cloth or paper in their hats, while the Loyalists put springs of pine in theirs. This is a situation where you don't have... Uh, uniforms in most cases for the Patriots and the Loyalists. The British certainly did, so they were easy to pick out with their red coats. But a lot of the Patriots, if not most, and the Loyalists were just wearing regular clothes. And so how do you tell who's friend and foe? Well, they did it with this system of white cloth and springs of pine. Ferguson's force was out in the open, and they were equipped with muskets. The Patriots charged up the hill. They were armed with rifles and fought mostly from the woods. So that's this is the classic stereotype of the Americans fighting from the woods with 
with long range rifles picking off British soldiers. Uh, that didn't always happen, of course. Scott and I have already talked about that. There were plenty of times when the Americans fought in regular battle formation, but not here. Here, they really do fight uh, almost in a guerrilla style. They fight more like the Indians than they do European soldiers. Yep, mountain style. Backwoods mountain style. Mountain style. Yes, sir. American rifle fire was deadly. After four Patriot charges, Ferguson himself was killed and the Loyalists tried to surrender. Many Americans yelled, give them Buford's play. In other words, or Buford's, uh, give them what happened to Buford. In other words, kill the prisoners. Don't let them surrender. Uh, there were some, some of the British and Loyalists who did surrender who were killed, but most were not. In the end, the Patriot militia killed 290, wounded 163, and captured 680. So the entire force was wiped out, if not killed or wounded, then captured. Total losses were 44%. I said the entire force, I'm sorry. Um, the Americans lost only 28 killed and 62 wounded. So that is not, that is an overwhelming American victory. The battle only lasted about an hour. Like Scott said earlier, the, the, these battles, especially the ones we're talking about today, are they're quick and they're relatively small. After the battle, the Patriots hanged nine loyalists as traitors. Uh, one Patriot said, would to God that every tree in the forest should bear fruit like that. So that's that's pretty uh, pretty bitter statement there. They wanted some and some of the Patriots wanted to hang all the loyalists. But in the end, cooler heads prevailed and that did not happen. More hangings were planned, but again, it was stopped by Patriot leaders. So that's the Battle of Kings Mountain. Afterward, Henry Clinton wrote, Kings Mountain was the first link in the chain of evils that followed in regular succession until they resulted in the loss of America. That's a pretty major statement coming from the senior British commander. He's, in other words, he's saying that Kings Mountain is where it all began to unravel and we began to lose the war. The Journal of the American Revolution says the annihilation of Loyalist militia on the South Carolina frontier forced the British to revise their southern strategy and demonstrated that their overextended forces could be defeated in detail. And then Tarleton himself, Tarleton, a bloody band, Bannister Tarleton said the destruction of Ferguson and his corps marked the period and the extent of the first exp expedition into North Carolina. The total ruin of his militia presented a gloomy prospect at the commencement of the campaign. So there's three different sources that talk about just what a huge deal this was. What a, what a great victory, almost a turning point for the Americans and a, a disaster for the British. Right. It makes it seem that they realize the advantages that the Patriots would have of these small militia strike forces they can't be countered with their own loyalist militias the way that they would have hoped and mitigate the natural advantages that the Patriots would have. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm Scott from the History Unplugged podcast. History can be a bit of a tongue twister with its weird sounding names of people, places, and things, but it really isn't that confusing. History is the story of who we are and how we comport ourselves while soaring to victory in battles over forts, seaports, and cities that fortunately thwarted the schemes of villains and their blood sports, like the 1415 Battle of Agincourt. It's about legal battles in courts about the contortion of torts over the retorts of consorts that turned into kangaroo courts. I exhort you to listen to History Unplugged on the podcast player of your choice, and you can listen to it while wearing shirts, shorts, skirts, skorts, or jean jorts. This is organized crime and punishment. History and crime like you've never heard it. Joy and Mustache Chris, Steve, and their crew as they take deep dives into the fascinating stories of the mafia. Find organized crime and punishment at the website organizedcrimeandpunishment.com and everywhere else you find great podcasts. Make sure you tell your friends about organized crime and punishment so that friends of yours can become friends of ours. Forget about it. For Cornwallis, just a couple things that happens after the battle. He's convinced to retreat from Charlotte back into South Carolina and make camp in Winsboro in 1780. He falls ill. He's there for three months. And then Patriots ratchet up their operations 
Francis Marion, he takes his forces to within a few miles of Georgetown before being driven back. Uh, Cornwallis sends Tarleton to destroy Sumter, and Sumter defeats Tarleton. And so these are the things that are happening. And then when we come up into Cowpens, Cornwallis is interestingly passive here. He doesn't take the field and attempt to defeat Green. Um, Cornwallis sends Tarleton to attack Daniel Morgan's army and Major General Alexander Leslie to reinforce Camden in front of Green. Uh, he remains in Winsboro, and there uh, Cornwallis is maybe feeling the helplessness of the situation. But anyway, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So what happens with Cowpens? Okay. Cowpens is our ninth key battle. Even though we're, as Scott said, we're knocking out two in one episode. That's that's a record. That's a first, isn't it? It is, yeah. So here's Daniel Morgan. So Daniel Morgan comes back into our narrative. Daniel Morgan, our listeners may remember, was uh, had gained fame as a commander of a great rifle unit. And uh, they were riflemen. They had played a huge role in the Battle of Saratoga. And now he's being sent south by Washington to join <clears throat> Nathaniel Green's army. Uh, I forgot to mention, I think, Scott, that after Gates, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but after Gates was relieved of command after he'd fled the battlefield in Camden, he was replaced by Nathaniel Green. Um, when, let me back up another step and say, when the British took Charleston uh, in 1778 or 1779, when the British took Charleston, Actually, 1780. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being pedantic here, but I, I feel like I need to get it right. When Charleston was captured and they surrendered to the British, the overall American commander in the South, Benjamin Lincoln, was with them. And, of course, he became a prisoner. So Gates was re- was appointed to replace him. And then, of course, Gates cowardly fled the battlefield in Camden, and he was fired. And when well, at the time that Gates was appointed – I mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it again. Washington wanted Nathaniel Green to be the overall commander in the South, but the Congress overrid him and appointed Gates instead. And then after Gates had his disastrous defeat at Camden, then the Congress said, all right, Washington, fine. You can have Nathaniel Green. Washington got his way the second time. And that's going to turn out to be a brilliant choice. Green, uh, some would say, is, is really the the second most effective American commander in the Revolutionary War. There are certainly others that could make you could make the argument for, but Green is he's a really solid commander. He's an excellent general. <clears throat> he decided to send Daniel Morgan with a force of militia and cavalry westward. So Green is dividing his army. Again, this is a he's violating, we've talked about this before. He's violating a, a cardinal maxim of war that you do not divide your force in the presence of a superior enemy, but he breaks the rule, just like later Robert E. Lee is going to break the rule many times in the civil war. The dividing of the army is risky, but green wrote quote, it makes the most of my inferior force for it compels my adversary to divide his Tarleton, by the way, banished to Tarleton persuaded Cornwallis to let him hunt down and destroy Morgan and the force he commanded so Morgan decided to set an ambush for Tarleton, Tarleton at Hannah's Cowpens. That was a meadow that was about 500 yards square with a couple of hills nearby. So a totally flat battlefield, complete opposite of King's Mountain. The ground was mainly flat, but it did have, a, I said totally flat, it did have a gentle slope that hid the American dragoons and it shielded the militia from view. So not totally flat, uh, mostly flat, but enough of a slope to where the Americans were able to hide. On January 16th, 1781, Morgan's 1,800 men deployed with a group of riflemen in front. They were in trees. They were followed by militiamen and then more riflemen. The night before the battle, Morgan told his men, just hold your heads up, boys. Give them three fires and you will be free. Then when you return home, how the old folks will bless you and the girls will kiss you for your gallant conduct. <laughs> so, Wow, he really breaks it down. I'm impressed. Yeah, a very much more positive motivation style than we saw from <laughs> Patrick Ferguson or the enemy's going to, you know, do all this horrible stuff. Instead, he's focusing on the positive things that will happen if they if they do their job. So the idea is the militia get in front, they fire three times, and then they fall back and yield to the regulars. 
So the next morning, Tarleton and the British, about 1,100 men in all, began marching toward them. As the British approached, the riflemen in front picked off many of them, then fell back and joined the second line. Then the militiamen fired off two volleys and fell back to the third line, and the British keep being drawn forward. So the Americans appear to be retreating, but it's actually a strategic retreat. It's a planned, organized retreat, which is luring the British toward the main force. Uh, everything actually goes pretty much according to plan, which very rarely happens in battles. <laughs> And as the British came forward, the Americans surrounded them. 110 British and Loyalists were killed, 200 were wounded, and 527 were captured. The Patriots lost only 25 killed and 124 wounded. So about 150 casualties total for the Americans uh, compared to, let me do some quick math, over 800 for the British. Tarleton escaped, and the Patriot cavalry commander William Washington, and yes, he was distantly related to George Washington. William Washington chased Tarleton, and the two briefly fought one-on-one, -on -one. but Tarleton shot Washington's horse and got away, and the Patriots also captured many valuable supplies. Uh, by the way, I, again, I, I, one more, maybe one more mention of the Patriot, the movie. Uh, the last battle, the climactic battle, the uh, at the end of the movie is loosely based upon the battle of Cowpens, but in this is a spoiler alert, by the way. So if you haven't watched the Patriot skip over this, but uh, at the end of that battle, the, uh, the British character based on Tarleton is killed. Of course uh, he's killed by Mel Gibson. <laughs> Mel Gibson's got to save the day in any movie he's in pretty much. But uh, in real life, Tarleton was not killed. He got away. Uh, to fight another day. But nevertheless, the British, again, are dealt an overwhelming defeat not long after King's Mountain, which was a, a defeat as well as we've seen. Cornwallis, on hearing about the disaster at Calpens, wrote, quote, the late affair has almost broke my heart. Aw, sorry, bud. So, yeah, <laughs> oh, poor guys. You broke me heart. Hmm. But anyway, so what do you think, Scott? Well, this is just a funny addendum to King's Mountain. Now, like you said, this is an overwhelming success. It rarely goes so simple and clean in battle. And when you have something that is a huge morale booster, everyone wants to say that they were there, even if they weren't. And the phrase that victory has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Well, there were many people who claimed to be at King's Mountain that actual were. And 40 years later, after the Revolutionary War, the pension applications for the war and in individual accounts caused some historians to believe that Morgan's force was as large as 1900 men when they were using these petitions as uh, firsthand sources. Uh, well, it wasn't Morgan might have underestimated his force at 800, but there's nowhere near as many as claimed that they were there. And just by way of analogy, in the modern era, to get VA benefits, there are many more people who claim to have been in the Vietnam War that actually were. So in the 2000 census, there were about 15 million Americans that claimed to be Vietnam vets, up from 11 million in 1995. And there were only actually 9 million on active duty in the war, and huh. maybe about 2.5 million that served in Vietnam and fewer than 1.6 that were in active combat. So it's almost like, wow, there must be a time machine because it keeps growing over time. And King's Mountain is probably one of the most exaggerated battles in the entire Revolutionary War of how many were there compared to how many claimed to have been there. It was small in the beginning. But anyway, that shows you how much of a morale booster it was for the Patriots if many if there was that much stolen valor going on. But uh, what are some other consequences of this battle in King's Mountain? A lot of consequences. First of all, Cornwallis lost one of his two light infantry units. That was Ferguson's, completely gone. Cornwallis tried to turn his entire army into a giant light unit, but that did not work well. In other words, they jettisoned a lot of their supplies and tried to march faster and farther each day, but that's going to turn out to be a disaster. Well, not really, maybe a disaster is too big of a word, but it's going to be a huge mistake when they start suffering from lack of supplies. Cornwallis was practically forced to abandon Charlotte as his base of operations. 
His supply line to Charleston was just now too vulnerable. He's going to have to move closer to the coast and, and a little bit north. The morale of the loyalists was crushed. On the other hand, the morale of the patriots was increased. Obviously, two major victories. Partisan activity increased in the Carolinas. So Cornwallis is now working in almost entirely hostile territory. So he's finding he's uh, a lone island of British force in the middle of extremely hostile territory and increasingly hostile. Cowpens also caused Cornwallis to lose his temper and to go on a long and destructive chase of Morgan, which is going to end up being not a good thing for him at all. Just to follow up on what you said about Cornwallis trying to turn his force quickly into a light infantry, he wanted to go all out and capture Morgan's little army. So Cornwallis burns his tents, baggage, and supplies. And if you can believe this, listener, he destroys his store of rum. Oh, no! (laughs) For a general to do that, and it's not just for him, but you're expected to give rich victuals at your officer's table. To not have rum, um, that... If, you, if we were on the high seas, nothing could guarantee mutiny faster than losing your rum. Not much better when you're on land. So Cornwallis mounted as much infantry as he could. He destroys his wagons except for those used as ambulances. And he's basically risking his welfare to capture Morgan before he escapes into Patriot-held Virginia. Uh, he knew that Morgan was encumbered by prisoners and captured equipment, and so he'd be slowed accordingly. But, well, it doesn't really work, so... Uh, What else is happening with the aftermath? I'm going to quote again from the Journal of the American Revolution. They have great quotes, and they sum up the uh, results of each battle really well. They say, This sudden defeat of a substantial British force stopped British offensive momentum in the South and renewed the spirits of American forces, initiating the campaign that brought the war to an end. Daniel Morgan himself later wrote, I was desirous to have a stroke at Tarleton, and I've given him a devil of a whipping. (laughs) So together, I would say Kings Mountain and Cowpens helped save the South for the Patriots, and it taught Clinton and Cornwallis that conquering the South would not be easy, maybe not even possible. All right. Well, I guess this is the South rising for the first time before the South threatens to rise again. Exactly. All right. Okay. Well, those are two battles in one episode, if you can believe that, listeners. But we're going to look at another battle that I don't think it's going to be as easy to contain in one as the other because this battle has a little bit more going on than these two. So the next episode, we're going to begin looking at the climactic battle of the Revolutionary War when we change our focus and look at Yorktown. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of Madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.